For anyone who's been observant around the roads of Shanghai lately, you'd have noticed some things which are pretty amazing considering the speed and scale that they're being done at. For starters, we've been having excavators re digging up pavement, sidewalk, road, only to repave it all in the span of about a week. In our district, they've done this whole process at least twice in the last two months. If you're particularly astute, under the Beijing Highway last week, you may have noticed these painters who were actually painting the underbelly of these elevated highways gray. Interestingly enough, the concrete is already gray. <laughs> now, what we're seeing is actually a huge degree of political control and efficiency. Unfortunately, what's not so amazing about all of this is that the type of renovation that's taking place is socially not the most efficient course of action to take. The reason for all the retouching of the roads in Shanghai is none other than Xi Jinping's visit that's upcoming. And it's funny, right? Because to many of us, we shrug our shoulders. It's not a visit that's very relevant to our daily lives. And it's almost amusing to see the city get into such a hassle over one visit from our, uh, our leader. Now, <laughs> but this, great, this greater image does show us something, however. And that is, we have a lot of potential to do right in our design and construction for us to get involved and talk about what we actually need. And it highlights a gap in managing our built environment. And it's becoming ever more pressing to talk about that. Because while Xi Jinping's visit may not have a direct impact on our lives, our happiness, and the fundamental social fabric of our community impacted by our environment is going to be worth that hassle. So we're going to have 2.5 billion more people in urban populations by the year 2050 mostly in nascent developing regions of Asia and Africa. Climate change is getting worse, and soon a lot of the things we do are going to become unviable. And so we have to get it right in the upcoming years in terms of what we're developing in these urban landscapes. And many of us simply aren't seeing that urgency. That's because there's a ton of biases in not caring about the built environment. Literal structural reasons why we don't care. For instance, we don't often notice the impact of our architecture on ourselves. When you're feeling down, you don't often go find solace in some architectural icon and instantly feel better, right? This, this image doesn't bring any intrinsic joy to us. <laughs> Palpability of impact is not common. It doesn't help that our buildings also have the tendency to fall apart. And so fixing up infrastructure seems to be a short-term solution for more entrenched systemic cultural issues. But that's simply not the case. Lastly there's an association with an extremely high barrier to entry when it comes with changing the literal brick and mortar of our society. And that's where we go wrong. Because we feel it's the job of the architect, the job of the urban planner, or the Chinese government to solve these things. And that's the problem, because we fall back into complacency. We're void of accountability. And this is bad, because we fail to realize the role of the citizen in how we can take back our urban landscapes. In, and we fail to realize the necessity to take these environments back. And that's what I want to do, begin combating the bias in confronting our urban world. I'm speaking from my experience in Shanghai as an observer, a student, and as a resident. I hope to reinvigorate some of the passion and urgency when it comes to discussing our designs and our behaviors that are shaped by our urban designs. And so in the time I've been given, I want to talk about a couple things. First. Why exactly are cities worth caring about in the first place? Second, where did we start going wrong in terms of development on a global scale? And third, what hope is there for us moving forward into the future? And what is our role in this? So first, what's so great about this? What's so great about Shanghai? At their essence, cities aren't these monolithic skyscrapers, nor are they the traffic-filled streets. They're people, dense, dense populations of people. And it's from that density that cities draw their strengths. Proximity enables connectivity, and it's from that where we gain the social and economic prosperity that cities give to us. Economically, it's simple. We're closer to human capital and opportunity. Businesses want to move closer where their labor and consumers are. This attracts them and creates a huge positive feedback loop in attracting more and more businesses, more and more opportunity. Economic migrants coming into cities is a wonderful sign that a city is doing well. They provide jobs, labor, but also consumption of goods within the city. And so we get a huge range of experiences available a metro ride away. Our own Shanghai Metro has 393 stations, ranging from airports, libraries, shopping roads, science centers, and more. 
but perhaps more importantly, but also more overlooked, is the social aspect of it all. Cities grant us a connection on a scale which would otherwise be unlikely. They enable the time, place, and opportunity for casual meetups. Proximity reduces the travel time, and foot traffic, tax dollars, and businesses create spaces for socialization. And because of the people and the infrastructure, there's more opportunity for community. There's more sports centers for athletes, more libraries for readers, more museums for art goers, more parks for people, and more places for everyone. Places to just hang out and experience together. Now, there are some very real impacts to all of this, right? It's not just some esoteric idea. Those living in less dense environments are less likely to participate in public life. They're statistically less likely to join social groups, political parties, and when the time comes, even vote. Civic engagement is relatively low there, and it's bad not just because our societies rely on civic participation to move forward, but also a second very real impact, and that's health. We're healthier in dense environments because we live in places worth caring about. We want to engage, and we want to participate. There's a physical aspect to this. Those living in less dense environments, specifically the suburbs, are less likely to drive everywhere. And when you take the statistics pertaining to diabetes, high cholesterol levels, high blood pressure, obesity, and other ailments caused either by too much driving, not enough exercise, and the fumes of cars, you get actually four years of aging per one year where you're living in suburbia and other less dense environments. It's clear, we see these in cities, and we see the strength of this in cities. But more importantly, you conversely see the social deficit of people who live in sprawl. A study in Zurich found that people who have a 45-minute uh, commute or above are 40% more likely to get a divorce. Driving means less time with friends and family. Kids are less likely to spend time with parents, and statistically, more likely to join gangs in some suburban areas. Suburban gangs, that's not something we typically think of and not the way the media normally portrays gangs. But when you think about the desolate environments where kids rarely see their parents because they're working all the time and they're commuting all the time, there's nothing to do in, the city, in their environments, it only makes sense for them to turn to these sorts of alternatives. People are happier when they're connected. Cities provide that. It's better to be somewhere dynamic, creative, and diverse. It's why those in cities are healthier, wealthier, and happier. And that's the strength of the city. But Somewhere, we began to go wrong. If connectivity is where cities draw their strengths, then they become resented and contradictory in nature when we build in a way which dismantles that connection. We, get, we began to build like this. This is suburbia. And while we may not live in this in Shanghai, there are other aspects of our city that are like this. So we began to build like this in the city, which is largely quite similar. Lots of roads, isolated residences, little spaces for activity, and, and these places are associated with all the aforementioned harms. Part of our bias for non-action is thinking the architectural forms and this sort of built environment is natural, and it follows some natural progression of urbanism that we don't have much a say in. But we did have a say in it, and our culture actually moved urbanism one way, and we need to know that our culture today can move it forward in the future. Two philosophies led us here to this kind of development. The first is separation. The industrial city was gross. Early planners and modernists liked to move things far away from uh, into their respective zones in some pure expression of functionality. It sounds pretty esoteric, and that's because it is. It doesn't really make much sense when you think about it. And they liked lots of rules to achieve their esoteric goals of functionality. And from this goal of separation, we got two things. First, a belief in dispersal. We get things like single-purpose zoning, Euclidean zoning, and big box retailers coming in. We killed connectivity and we killed interaction because we destroyed the capacity for different spheres of life to mingle with one another. But second, we get space configured almost like sculpture, right? Dedicated to some esoteric idea of functionality that, that I talked about earlier. But when you think about it, only the architect is the one that has this idea in mind, because he fails to take into account the complex nuance and interaction that happens within these public spaces oftentimes. And what you get is these large public squares and buildings, forms suggesting some grand idea. And developers love it too, because it's easy to manage. There's less greenery, 
less people to care about. The problem is the scale of ideas is not often the scale of humans. We miss interaction when we build with separation. The second philosophy is that of speed. This image is of the exhibit entitled Futurama from the 1939 New York World Fair. It was presented as a model on how the world would look like in the next 20 years, so by then 1959. The most salient feature is pretty clear. These large, massive, six-lane freeways with the occasional high-rise scattered here and there. It's strikingly reminiscent of the highways of Shanghai. And it's no surprise that the, argument that the sponsors of this exhibit were none other than General Motors themselves. The argument GM and other automobile and petroleum companies made is that we are freer when we transcend the mobile capacities of our natural bodies. Freedom comes with unadulterated speed. Instead of building our structures closer to one another, we opted to drive and commute towards them, meaning that we would actually have to spend more time in congestion, meaning we would have less access to these structures. We did not gain the freedom GM proposed. The message of, and propaganda of these companies stuck, however, and so we built on another inhuman scale, the scale of cars. Now, both of these philosophies encourage us to spread and destroy connectedness, and they culminate in suburbia. And suburbia is sort of a euphemism for one hell of a negative externality, because building on the scale of giants, dispersal, is the worst form of our urbanism. We pay for the blunder in planning with our own physical, mental, and social health. We pay with the massive carbon emissions promoted by cars and suburbia because we can't sustain public transport in these areas of dispersal. We pay with the soul-crushing hours of driving in traffic to work to and fro. And we pay in the opportunity cost of spending time with family, friends, and anybody for that matter. We pay with our lives and the quality of them. Now, those trends in dispersal aren't fully present in the city, but we've too often absorbed the negative design principles that lead to a more disconnected life. We're still push pushing isolated residences into the expert into the excerpts, we're still a city based on cars, we could still use more accessible public space, and we could still listen to the input of ourselves, the citizens. We need to do better. And that's where the future lies, in us. The first step to solving any problem is recognizing that there is one. We need that awareness moving forward. And we can't let the structural biases of ignoring the built environment um, force us into not acting on the problem we have at hand today. We have to make sure, as urban citizens today, we lead the forefront of positive development tomorrow. We don't want new cities to be modeled for the car and sprawl. The future deserves better. We need to be aware of the behaviors we conduct and what those behaviors support. And there's a lot of new innovation around today, and it's an era of experimentation where we live in. So part of this, as what we have to do as citizens, is supporting the right sort of technology and design. And we're getting many things in terms of this. I'll miss a lot of the cool urban innovations in the time I have left, but here are some things that have made a change, and I hope it instigates more exploration in terms of how, how we can be aware of how we design our spaces around us. So first, bike sharing. It's wonderful for connectedness in London, Paris, and of course, Shanghai. Easy transport for everyone. Accessible, low emission, effective. We better engage with the street and others when we're on a bike. Second, rush hour taxation. Personal vehicles take too much space. They have too much emission per rider, and it's time to pay for that cost. So Singapore and London have already done this, where they tax their rush hours, so it costs more money to ride on the road in a personal car. And inevitably, you get lower rates of congestion, you have lower emissions, and you have more public transport, because more people choose that substitute. You can recirculate tax money into supporting better metro lines as well. Then we have the reclamation of space for better, more public-oriented development. This is an image of Times Square before and after Mayor Bloomberg and Jeanette Sadik Khan decided to block off the roads in exchange for public space. Um, they added more seating and they repaved so that you have pedestrian areas. Now, there's a huge benefit to this because not only do people want to come to these areas just to hang out, but there's an economic benefit in terms of these businesses getting more foot traffic. And, a cause of, and a, as, as a reflection of that, you see retail rates double in Times Square after this policy. There's a lot we can learn from the public spaces of New York and the public spaces around the world. 
Shanghai itself has somewhat of a public space problem because most of our public space looks something like this, right? It's the sort of gated areas, closed, not enough greenery, not enough seating. It's not very good, right? It's kind of unwelcoming. That or either it looks something like this. And these are these large industrial or commercial or, in, or like business parks. But the truth is they're not really parks. They're just places with buildings. And that's not very good because no one wants to go there. We can change this by having a reinvigoration of, more better, uh, of better zoning laws. We're going to have things like having zoning laws which are smaller in, in scale that are going to promote more dense multi-purpose development. And because you have this, you're going to get better public space. The combination of a variety of shops, the combination of a variety of places to go is going to make things better for us. But the last solution is us, the citizens. And this is the key point here. Because while we may not be able to contribute to a lot of the innovation, a lot of the urbanism that's happening, what we can do is learn how we interact with our environment and how we act in terms of one another and how we interact with the built world. What does this mean? This means that we're going to have to be prepared to be better neighbors. It means that we have to be prepared to do things like support bike sharing, to support co-housing, and things like that. It means we have to be better prepared to engage in conversation with one another on our built environments, because that is going to be the better issue, the better state of mind in terms of this. We made a choice, a very deliberate choice, in the 20th century to move to density. And that choice has, has served us well. We're more connected, we're happier, we're healthier. But we made mistakes too. And so we got into the era of sprawl, we got into the era of cars. We need to take back that choice. We need to look at that choice and reevaluate how we're going to move in terms of the 21st century where more people are going into cities. We need to look at ourselves and our environments, the way we interact, our behaviors, the technologies, and be aware of all that's going on around us. Because only through then do us as citizens properly engage with the city. We have to take back the choice of living in a city, and we have to make that choice as meaningful as possible. Thank you. <laughs>